When people think of fairies, the first thing that comes to mind is usually a friendly winged girl in some film or storybook. But this is not an accurate representation of the reality. These creatures are dangerous. The term fairy is often used as a broad category that covers many types of creatures in British folklore. Hobbs, brownies, redcaps and countless other creatures are classified as distinct races of fairy. Now traditionally, fairies have been divided into two categories, the Seely Court and the Unseely Court. The former is what this video will focus on, the creatures that are referred to specifically as fairies. I'll save the other specific races of fairy for another time. Fairies are typically humanoid in appearance, albeit usually small. They go by many names, such as the good folk, the wee people, or the fair folk. They're typically not 100% malicious, like many other creatures can be. In fact, they can and do help humans, either in exchange for goods and services, or simply by their own goodwill. That said, fairies can harm humans. They can play many practical jokes or tricks, but also can be overly aggressive or malicious as a consequence of human aggression or aggravation. The fairies have been a part of life and superstition for the people of Britain for centuries, and so this video will attempt to take a look into the characteristics and culture of the fairy folk. I tell many fairy stories on this channel, so this video can serve as a means to better understand the creatures. The place that the fairies inhabit is not entirely of this world. What humans have often referred to as fairyland is clearly not somewhere that can be found on any map. It's another realm entirely and is most commonly found by humans via entrances in mounds and barrows. It's incredibly difficult to find or access their world, but they can and do access ours at their own leisure. The fairy society, as far as we can presume, is clan or tribe based, often with a monarch that they pay homage to. They live as a collective in their mounds and barrows, and are rarely seen alone. What's fascinating is the documentation of time differences between our world and the fairy realm. Time goes by much faster in our world. Many tales tell of people entering a fairy mound and partaking in a dance or party with the fairies that lasts no more than a couple of hours. And when they leave, they discover that years have passed in our world and many of their friends and relatives are long dead. We don't know all too much about the culture of fairies. The goals they have as a society remain a mystery to us. Many fairies are seen taking part in various trades and jobs in our world, from blacksmithing to carpentry to farming. According to 19th century superstition, Saturday was said to be the fairy Sabbath, and Friday was when the fairies amused themselves by grooming the beards of goats. The most well-known fairy cultural activity is probably making use of their musical talents. When people discover an open door to a fairy mound, the fairies inside are usually in full swing with a celebration. There's variations in tunes and instruments depending on their geographic location. The music is often heard in our world as well. Many fairy processions are seen on top of hills or in fields and forests and sometimes even near human residences. These processions are often referred to as raids, and are carried out for a number of reasons, from seasonal celebrations, to marching to war, to funeral processions. As well as music, fairies love to partake in dancing. This always takes the form of dancing in a circle at some place of significance to them. The lights and music from these dancers are known to attract passers-by who enjoy watching the spectacle. The fairies usually don't mind people watching, so long as they're respectful. However, some simply don't take too kindly to being spied on. These fairy dancers leave behind a ring of mushrooms or toadstools, which today we can still see quite commonly. I mentioned that some of the processions are marches to war. The fairies were known to wage war against insects, 
or other folkloric creatures, and sometimes even humans. In fact, fairies in Northumberland were well known to be quite good at mastering horses, small fairy horses, and using them as cavalry. The more evil influence of fairies is said to be strongest during the first three days of May, but there are ways of warding off the fairy folk, means of protecting yourself from them and keeping them at bay. You could protect your home by scattering primroses across the threshold, as fairies couldn't pass this flower. The fairies were also kept away by wood from the rowan tree. Travellers often kept a few shavings in the pocket to avoid being taken. Mortals could also safely watch fairy processions by placing a rowan branch over the doors. The fairies also feared iron, so carrying a knife or horseshoe was a sure means of keeping them at bay. A story from Lancashire, recorded in the 1880s, states that the bells of St Mary's Church in Penwortham were tolling for a funeral. A few moments later along the path, there came a procession of mournful fairies carrying a little coffin with its lid half open. This shows us that death and burial is also part of life for the fairies. Although the man that witnessed this procession died a month later, so fairy funerals are considered bad omens. Fairies typically don't like churches though. There are many examples of fairies sabotaging churches during construction. St Matthew's Church in Walsall is one such example where fairies remove the foundations to the church and place it where the church stands today because the original site was sacred to them. Fairies can and often do bestow blessings upon humans. This can come in the form of physical gifts and perhaps the most famous example of this would be the fairy flag. This was given to the MacLeods of Dunvegan Castle on the Isle of Skye. It's said that if ever the MacLeods are in dire need, all they must do is unfurl the flag. The flag grants them the ability to multiply the clan's military forces, save the lives of certain clan folk. It can also cure a plague on cattle, and increase the chances of fertility, and also bring Heron back into the lock at Dunvegan. Yet the fairy folk told them that this flag could only be used three times. The clan has already used the power twice, leaving them only one more use before the magic's gone forever. Not all fairy objects are given freely though. The Musgrave family from Cumberland kept a fairy crystal cup at their home in Eden Hall. It was said that the cup was stolen by the fairies from a butler who discovered them one moonlit night when they were drawing water from a nearby well. As the butler ran away with the cup, it said that the fairies sang the following ditty. If that glass either break or fall, Farewell to the look of Eden Hall. Another story from Stainen in Lancashire tells of an old farmer who was ploughing at the break of day when no one else was awake, when suddenly he heard the voice of a little girl crying. I've broken me speed. The farmer turned to see a tiny girl, who was certainly a fairy. In one hand she held a tiny broken spade, and in the other she held some tiny nails and a hammer. She held out the spade towards the farmer who gently took them and mended it. When he'd finished, the fairy gave him a handful of silver. Fairy gifts can also come in the form of bestowing abilities on people. Such is the tale of the fairies of Barra, where a young apprentice carpenter captured a shawl dropped by a fairy and returned it on the condition that she gives him the power of being a master carpenter. Some gifts can come as a kind of compensation after being kidnapped. For example, near the border town of Melrose, there's a stone which marks the spot where Thomas the Rhymer was taken by the fairy folk. They returned him to our world seven years later, with the gift of prophecy. Wishes can also be granted by the fairies. In Underlaid Wood in Westmoreland, you'll find the fairy steps. It's said that if you make a wish at the bottom, it will be granted by the fairies if you can climb the narrow staircase without touching the sides. The fairies are often seen running up and down the stairs themselves. What's important though is the fairies don't like their gifts being ignored or unappreciated. The fairies of Pencher Hill in County Durham 
gave a man some bread and fairy butter in exchange for him mending the bucket, and he dared not eat it. The consequence of this was both his horses died the next day. Likewise, the fairies of Great Tossen in Northumberland killed a dog who refused to eat the cake. Babies in Britain were considered at risk of being stolen by the fairies, especially if they were pretty. The risk was that the fairies would carry away the baby and take it to their own world, and leave in its place a changeling. You could tell if a baby was a changeling, often if it cried a lot, hated being touched, was unresponsive when spoken to, or was simply just ugly. People often carried out strange little rituals which the changelings expressed intrigue or disgust over to find out whether they were a changeling or not, and if they were, then they'd shoot up the chimney and return to the fairies. This is what a blacksmith did on the Isle of Skye when his son was taken. He filled up some eggshells with water from a bucket and began to heat them by the hearth, totally confusing and angering the changeling. One tale from Wales recalls a mother that was out working in the fields, and when she returned, she found that, in place of a baby, there was an old hideous creature. Other tales tell of mothers disposing of these creatures in ways like throwing them off a bridge, and then they find the real child waiting for them back at home. Other babies have to be found by more forceful means, like heading to the nearby fairy mound and threatening the fairies with iron or other items that they fear. Placing a horseshoe or a bit of rowan wood near a baby's crib can prevent this from happening in the first place though. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this little video on fairies and British folklore. It only just scratches the surface, but hopefully it gives you a bit more of an understanding into the nature of these creatures. You can find in the description links to individual fairy stories that I've covered, and I'll keep that list updated as I make more.